I felt You don't need animations to have again. Can I try and use it? Can I use it? No, that's right. Okay, no. We need like a place to take it. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's not bad. 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 It's not You know, amuse yourselves. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> Hey, it's which one? Okay. Okay, afternoon everybody, welcome to the IAE seminar series for this week, apologies for the delay, we had some technical difficulties, um, today's speaker is our awesome leader of the EcoDNA team, Professor Diane Gleeson. Thanks, Di. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and apologies that the slides might be a bit weird because they were in a different format. Anyway, just life. And that's what happens when you make your start doing your talk at four o'clock this morning because you realise that you had it today. And um, this was a little last minute um, fill in because um, another speaker was meant to be in this spot. So I was pretty much trying to do people a favor and then I realized then I regretted it <laughs> immediately okay so what I wanted to talk about today is obviously eDNA because um, that is kind of our thing um, but in the context of um, global um, biodiversity monitoring so really taking this big and at scale and I think we're kind of ready for it and we're definitely ready because we are in a world of um, pain in terms of biodiversity. And so I'm going to sort of set the scene a little bit about where we sit and it's um, not nice reading. It's not fun to look at this. Um, this is the Earth Overshoot Day. Um, so it's a day in which 
um, humanity has consumed all the resources the planet is capable of producing in a year. Now, where it's been um, obviously creeping back since 1970, Earth Overshoot Day was the 29th of December. It is now the 2nd of August. Um, had a nice little blip there where it was all looking good for COVID. See, COVID actually did some good things, <laughs> slowed down that. But um, but yeah, gradually it's um, it's working its way backwards, which is not great. Now that's the overall Earth Overshoot Day. And then when it kind of, uh, when we nail down into a bit more detail about individual countries, then it um, looks a bit more miserable. And oh, as we can see here, um, if, if everyone was to behave like Australia, we would have overshot in March. Um, that, that's in 2023, by, um, by March, we would have um, already consumed all of our um, natural resources at that stage. So this is our, um, it's not looking great. And also, so countries that aren't doing this are countries that we would probably not want to live like, maybe sort of like Iraq and, and some areas like that at the moment. But um, you can see that there's quite a real difference in how on what the sort of footprint is for each country. So we're not in good shape and we desperately need to be um, reversing what we are doing in terms of nature. And we know that, um, well, I don't know if you do know, but there is this now nature positive movement. So what the nature positive movement is, is to pull us out of this sort of negative um, crisis that we're in with in regards to biodiversity and to pull us into the positive in terms of improving our indicators of biodiversity. There is the aim to be net positive by 2030 and have full recovery by 2050. And that's essential for us as a planet to be able to um, sustain and maintain moving forward. Uh, we have a lot of emphasis on carbon. There's been a lot of emphasis previously on carbon and carbon related reporting. It's now getting to the point of reporting on what impacts there are on nature. So what has happened recently in order to try and get this nature positive movement to be actually actionable? Because as much as what governments can do, where the action has to happen is in big corporations and in the financial sector, because it is those um, corporations that are having the biggest impact when it comes to our um, you know, impacts on nature. So just um, in the last couple of years is this task force in nature related financial disclosures. Now this is an international task force and in um, alignment and similarity to what the carbon related financial disclosures, it's now, this has now just hit the ground. So the final um, release of the final version of the TNFD was just released um, last month in September. And what the TNFD does, and this is a terminology which I you know, encourage you all to learn about, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, it's a new global initiative. And the aim of it is to shift global financial flows away from negative nature, um, nature negative outcomes to these nature positive outcomes. Um, data and information gaps are currently preventing these financial institutions from assessing nature-related risks and how they can actually act. So out there in the financial world, private corporations are realizing that nature impacts severely on their bottom line. Um, it is impacting on things like supply chains, security of their products, how they're going to operate moving forward in the future. And a recent um, uh, conference that involved all the sort of CEOs of the sort of top 20% um, of um, major corporations in Australia met. And when they were asked what the biggest risk um, was to them to continue doing business, it is um, what's happening with nature. So they recognize it. They want to do something about it. But the data is not there. The ability to go out and monitor is not available or easily accessible currently. But definitely it is coming. And there's a lot of organizations out there that are seeing this, this niche and the ability to jump in there and try and provide this data. Um, unfortunately, the data information that we currently have and where a lot of these organizations are mining that data is things through the Atlas of Living Australia, which we know is patchy, depauperate, not necessarily fit for purpose for this kind of thing. 
But the whole thing of the TNFD, it's about assisting in developing nature-related action plans to deliver nature-positive business models. So what does that look like? What does it mean? What does it mean on the ground? And um, how is Australia responding to this? So firstly, um, the key concepts and what the TNFD is. The TNFD is, is all of these four key things about nature dependency. So how they need finding out firstly how your business relies on provisioning services from nature. Nature impacts, so how does your activities um, negatively or positively affect nature? The nature-related risks, how those dependencies and impacts might create ecosystem market or regulatory risks, and nature-related opportunities, so activities that reduce impacts or restore nature while benefiting business. So it's really kind of turning this into a kind of a business financial speak in terms of nature. So um, what is Australia doing? Australia, um, in the last couple of years under Tanya Politisek, has developed this nature repair market um, strat you know, idea that's been proposed. And through the release of this nature repair market bill um, that had um, was put forward to be passed through Senate. Now, um, Unfortunately, as much as the nature repair market bills, um, you know, and, and this whole nature repair market idea was looking on the surface like it could really deliver this for Australia and have Australia being one of the first sort of really kind of green market um, in this financial sector, it um, got kiboshed at the, in, back in, I'm thinking about probably June uh, was when, it, when this happened. And interestingly, it was um, kiboshed by the Greens. You would have thought the Greens would have been really positive about this idea. But as you can see from this headline here, the Greens, um, and this is from their website, the nature repair market should be scrapped in light of Plibersex Offset's audit. Because it was sort of trying to compare this, um, the biodiversity credits nature repair market with the offsets um, um, strategies, which are probably not ideal they aren't really one and the same. So that's that's my opinion. And then you had the Teal MPs criticizing the Greens being so short-sighted. Their opposition to the um, this nature repair market bill was actually, um, as they say, cutting off their nose to spite their face. But the leader, Sarah Hanson-Young, says this that we are not ready for this green Wall Street and it's not what nature needs. So now we've got... Um, you know, politics waiting in, you've got um, a lot of debate and discussion about um, trying to implement something like this in Australia. And um, the, whereas then you've got Federated Farmers who desperately want to be doing something because that's really important for agriculture for Australia, for Australia to be showing that it's actually positively impacting back onto nature, that they're doing, trying to do their best they um, were actually quite horrified by this. They were, and theirs is Greens posturing on nature repair bill, unhelpful. So we've got organizations, corporations out there that are really wanting to, to run with this, but it is getting hamstrung and hamstrung at a political level. And then if you go back to our, our original um, slides there on our overshoot days and where we're headed in terms of our biodiversity crisis, none of this is helpful. So this nature repair market for Australia, which was is um, sort of being coined Green Wall Street, um, the values in and around it, the Australian biodiversity market has been estimated to be worth 137 billion. The participation in the market would be um, essentially voluntary. That's what was being put forward for this nature repair market bill to allow landholders and other eligible people to generate certificates for projects that manage protect and restore nature. So they would they would essentially be given credits for this. Holders of those certificates then are able to sell them. So this is where the monetary aspect is. So they'll be able to sell them to buyers and the buyers of certificates um, could be companies or organizations that are required to offset their biodiversity impacts for their projects. So there's, there's goes the money flow. So any project that's designed to enhance or protect biodiversity and native species would qualify as being a biodiversity project under the bill. Those projects could include things like improving or restoring existing na native vegetation through fencing, weeding, or reveg projects, planting of mixed species, protecting grasslands, a whole range of um, activities could be deemed to be this. Um, 
This is not something new in terms of accounting for nature. At the moment, um, for example, there, this is the spot prices for different species. Um, so this is from New South Wales government. These are the latest um, prices for species-based credits. And you can see, the, you can go online, you can find this data. Um, this is just giving you the, the timelines of what um, each of these unit um, costs, well, what unit prices are, and for, the, for your credits for um, maintaining or keeping some of these species. So you can see that, you know, there, there's monetary values assigned to species. Um, an article in the conversation in April, um, this was by um, some other academics at, um, at the University of Melbourne. They um, also um, noted what was happening with the nature repair market bill. Can it really save Australia's environment? It's not perfect, but it's worth a shot. And I think that's the thing. It's not perfect. Nothing's ever perfect, um, but it is worth definitely having a go at something and seeing how this is going to play out. The longer things um, stall at this government level, the more um, chance there is of it actually not getting traction or the potential for, given the short timeframes that governments are, are in term or in office, by the time this possibly sees the light of day again, because it's gone back to review and it'll be presented again, probably not until next year, you're starting to move next into the next round of um, election cycles. And we've seen this in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, just recently, um, change of government from the, the um, sort of left, more environmentally friendly government to now back to a, a right-leaning government, You've seen a scrapping of a massive um, environmental reform that was just about to go through, which was known as the Three Waters Program. And that Three Waters Program was about consolidating everything regarding water management and water resources for New Zealand, moving it out of regional councils and turning it into these kind of key kind of major national bodies. One of the things, um, there was so much uncertainty in around it and it became part of an election campaign and the national government in New Zealand now that's come in, that's one of the first things they're going to do is scrap it. So this is the kind of thing that is likely to happen if it stalls and there's uncertainty and if the academic community can't get together on it and the political um, forces can't get together on this, then, you know, it's, it's um, a sad thing, I think, moving forward. So um, what, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, start to move towards the, the eDNA side of this, but, um, okay, one of the, the key things is about providing that, the ability to go out and assess nature. So the core challenges um, to, to be able to deliver on this is, um, can be captured in these four words, which is credibility, collection, consistency, and connection. So what we need is credible, high quality, scientifically robust state of nature data. And um, we still struggle to deliver on that. We need the collection of additional high quality state of nature data to fill critical data gaps. Because if you look at the um, state of the environment reporting, which drew, drew upon um, data like the ALA, it's incredibly patchy and it's, it's, it's not representative. So there are so many gaps from an Australian perspective. Consistency, we need to enhance the consistency of nature related data to improve its decision usefulness to data users. So having a consistent approach that is um, you know, adopted in a consistent manner, otherwise we're not gonna be able to reuse it for other purposes. And that connection, Connecting and maintaining data from different sources so that it's accessible and meets the information and analytical needs of data users. So those are the four kind of key challenges. So this is where I come to environmental DNA. <laughs> and I'll get back on, on, my, on my soapbox about eDNA. eDNA is amazing. And it has been a technology that has exploded in recent times. Although... We would say that many of us have been working on eDNA for a long time because anything where we were dealing with trace DNA from the environment really is actually eDNA. But I would say that sort of eDNA started to kind of really kick off um, in, um, you know, around the you know, early 2010, 2011. 2008 was the kind of first, what they say, the landmark paper, which was um, Fisitola's paper, um, which looked at bullfrogs in Europe out of some ponds. And it was a pretty innocuous paper. It just was like, oh, yeah, we can get DNA out of water and we can say, you know, we can show the presence of bullfrog. 
so it didn't really, you know, capture a huge amount of excitement. Um, but it wasn't until it started to get applied into a bigger project. And this was in the US um, when the invasive carp was found moving into the Great Lakes, which um, was a really big deal to try and keep carp out of the Great Lakes. Now, this was a friend of mine, Lindsay Chatterton, who um, used to work at the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. He had moved to the US, was working for the Nature Conservancy over there, and collaborating with the University of Notre Dame. He saw that paper and went, hey, wonder if we can collect um, water samples from the Great Lakes and look for the presence of carp. And they did, and they found it, and it absolutely changed a whole lot of things around how carp were monitored, about the management of the um, river systems that were feeding into the Great Lakes. And so from there, it really sort of catapulted this whole area and field of eDNA. Um, and now we see this extraordinary um, breadth of application of eDNA, everything from um, you know, measuring biodiversity, detecting particular species, biomonitoring and biosecurity, which is something that our team spends a lot of time doing as well, dietary analysis, food web analysis, detecting invasive species, being able to use this technology to access difficult environments that otherwise would be really hard and challenging to do, um, to be able to provide that rapid data, impacts of industry. There's been a lot of work done by um, our colleagues at the university, um, at Curtin University in Western Australia on mining and mining rehabilitation and impacts of mining, um, through to um, everything from um, overall environmental change and being able to monitor that. So our team, um, I've been really fortunate in the time that I've been here. So I've been here now since um, 2012, but we kind of kicked off in 2013 with our initial funding on eDNA. And we've got an incredible team. I have to really um, uh, pay my um, attributes to uh, Elise Verlin, who was the original postdoc with me. She's still with me. <laughs> and and um, we've been a great team. Um, Alejandro, uh, more recently, as you know, is, is a force here and an incredible team of technical um, support people and PhD students. And, um, and of course, um, well now we've got Helen kind of keeping us together from a business perspective. So I know a number of you are here and I just want to acknowledge that, you know, your efforts, your ability to produce amazing data and to kind of work to the standards that we've been doing is, is um, got us to where we are. So thank you. Um, so we kind of kicked off and, uh, in 2013 so we're now 10 years and so I want to have a just you know reflect on that our celebration of 10 years of eDNA here at University of Canberra and the you know sort of eDNA novel sense new sense we produce a lot of papers and you know that's all been great these have been you know a lot of good papers a lot of good stuff that has shown the real kind of things around the basic ecology of, of eDNA how we go about sampling our detection probabilities quantitative frameworks the right methods how to go about analyzing um, all of those things have been in these papers so we've done a lot of fundamental basic research um, and a lot of these publications in general um, that we're seeing out of the, the whole field of eDNA is changing quite dramatically. Um, we're seeing that um, over the course of, of here we are in the last sort of five years of publications up into 2021, we're seeing more publications on biodiversity monitoring than um, the, the kind of publications that were at the early stage of eDNA, we were really focusing on protocol development and optimization and understanding the ecology of eDNA. So now there's more applications um, happening using eDNA as a tool. Um, this is one of, uh, this is a project that uh, Jonas Beilemans, who was one of our early PhD students did. And I always come back to this one because it just, you know, demonstrates a really on ground action and the sensitivity of eDNA and, and this was one of the first studies where there was an actual management action on the basis of eDNA. So this was a project um, that was looking at improving um, the containment of a freshwater invader, which was redfin perch, that was um, moving up from the Lachlan River into the Blakeney Creek, into the Umrawalla Creek. And this is the last, one of the last stronghold of uh, two populations left of this um, southern pygmy perch. And Redfin perch were gradually moving up into this area and causing the, um, you know, the 
basically wiping out this particular species. What they do is, I mean, redfin perch are predators, but they also have disease. They're just a bad invasive um, species. So what they were wanting to do is look at, to where to place a barrier to prevent the redfin perch moving up and in, in further up into this habitat and try and save this last population, uh, one of these last populations. So we went alongside with eDNA, alongside of traditional methods of um, electrofishing and netting, and we did our sampling alongside of that. So um, this is where that red line there is where um, the extent to where detection was able to be um, obtained using the traditional method. And um, us with eDNA, we found it the presence of redfin perch much further upstream. So in terms of the decision of where to make that, um, to place that barrier, uh, if you had a possibly you know, utilize the traditional method, you might have placed a barrier actually behind the incursion front. Um, here it is, this innocuous little pile of rocks. And I come back to it being like, this This is, you know, to me more important than the publications in many ways, because this has actually worked. It has prevented further incursion of redfin perch into this habitat. We've um, hopefully through this technology been really instrumental in, in saving this one of these last populations. However, it's not always, you know, it's not entirely perfect and there are limits to how you can detect or how many individuals you can detect out in the environment when numbers drop down. So when you're dealing with really rare and low level numbers of species that are individuals that are of a species that you're trying to target, this was demonstrated with uh, a paper of Elise, um, Elise's, which was um, in the Journal of Applied Ecology. It's a really nice piece of work with Richard Duncan, um, where we're looking at um, how, how useful could eDNA be in this eradication program out of, of carp out of um, Lake Sorrel in Tasmania. So um, this was work where, and it's, and this was kind of challenging because it was a really big lake. So we went out, we did a whole bunch of eDNA sampling, and then we were able to utilize the, those samples and put this into this uh, modeling context. So um, if, so what this is showing is that if we have 200 carp remaining in Lake Sorrel, noting that Lake Sorrel is a very large lake, you would need, in order to detect um, to get a 95% detection probability with eDNA, you would need to take 7,144, 600 mil samples of water and filter those. So at that point, you're probably going, that's possibly not a cost-effective move. Um, and although when we costed it out, the, um, the Inland Fisheries Service of Tasmania weren't horrified by that amount of money. It was, a, well, I think we costed it out to be about $600,000 to do that. Um, it was costing them over almost $2 million to deploy people out on boats anyway. So at the end of the day, um, it is what it is. But that is the other good thing about eDNA is that you can kind of get this sort of quantitative approach to things and then it can help you decide whether eDNA is the right thing for the thing that you're trying to do. And that's another really important thing that we've been working on in the last few years of when is it useful, when is it not? And this is um, just an example from Jack Rohan, who's um, a our PhD student. And again, um, showing you how sometimes things are, you know, doesn't necessarily work how you think it's going to, but then you make the changes as you need. Um, so Jack was working on red-eared slider turtles and um, red-eared sliders are a invasive species. Um, they are little populations that pop up occasionally and both New South Wales, here in New South Wales and in Queensland, and they're always trying to, you know, wipe them out <laughs> where, they, where they pop up. Um, they needed a, a, an ability to detect them, um, particularly when numbers are dropping, you know, when they're trying to control them and they want to know whether they're still there or not. So we were like, oh, yeah, eDNA, not a problem. We'll be able to deliver this. So um, we did, as we normally do, and we're doing our species-specific assays, we um, got some redhead sliders. Um, Jack shoved them in up here in the rearing facility, shoved them in some tanks, did all the right things, which is like we've got a redhead slider, we've got a known volume of water, we've developed a beautiful assay, we've, um, and he even showed that he could do comparably a field-based assay versus a lab-based assay. So in this case, you know, our lab-based assays, how long it kind of normally takes us to, to you know, extract the DNA and go and um, do our qPCR. 
we can take that to the field and use these portable technologies now. So we now have the, the ability to do it in situ. Anyway, showed all this, beautiful, looked stunning. Um, and then, um, so then this is Jack out in the field. Actually, that, yeah, I'm trying to remember where he was in there, but one, that one. But anyway, out in the field. And um, here, <laughs> here is a, this is a lovely example um, where we got um, this, this is a pond in Sydney and sort of in the Centurion Gardens in Sydney. And this is where we've collected water for doing an eDNA samples. We fail to detect, or we've got very patchy detection. So it's not, it's not as you would expect. And you can see, here's our redhead slider sitting on a rock. So here we've got one of these assholes right here, and we fail to detect it. So sampling right practically next to it. So that's telling you that this method wonderful as it is, works beautifully in the lab, beautifully in our, you know, um, mesocosm experiment, take it out to the field, it's not working. Now, why is that? So there's obviously something about redhead sliders and their biology, they're just not, um, they're not shedding as much eDNA, maybe whatever it is that they're doing, they're just not going to be detectable other than maybe we would have to increase our sampling if it's so high. So instead, um, what we decided to do is have a little, like I say, a little pivot on this. And um, I've lost my button. Oh, okay. So um, in Queensland and a couple of um, locations where there were redhead sliders and they're trying to monitor them, they have these things called basking pontoons. So redhead sliders haul themselves out into a basking pontoon um, with use of camera traps. They can visualize them and go, aha, there are redhead sliders in this pond. Now, um, of course, where these ponds are located in Queensland and outer suburbs of Brisbane, some of those outer suburbs are a little less desirable. Um, needless to say, you won't want to be leading, leaving out your camera equipment because, um, yeah, they get a bit snaffled for other purposes. So um, they were finding that that was not, that's not something that was sustainable to be able to, to deploy. So, but the basking pontoons work and no one cares about stealing basking pontoons. So um, what... Uh, we decided to do was put a substrate there of when they haul themselves out like a bit of sandpaper they leave behind their DNA on the sandpaper and then from there you can swab the basking pontoon and um, use that as a method and that has worked stunningly beautifully we were able to show in fact we were doing a um, we were when we were doing the initial kind of um, proof of concept of this up in Queensland, there were these ponds where they knew they had, they knew that there were redhead sliders because I caught them on camera. Um, so that was our positive control site. We used another pond a bit further away that, um, you know, supposedly didn't have any, and we got a low level of positive detection from that pond. Um, and you're always with eDNA, always a little stressed about, yeah, like, was that contamination? Oh my God, you know, and because that was supposed to be our negative pond. And of course, then they went back and they monitored more closely and they found one red red slider turtle. So that it was really effective. And, and so since then, um, we've just been carrying out a service where um, uh, the DPI Queensland people, they just send us um, swabs, don't they, Kim? Yeah. Sending us, sending us little, little packets of swabs and testing for um, red red sliders. But prior to this, there was another group actually up in Queensland that had a assay for redhead sliders and we're offering a service for eDNA and that was all based on water samples and clearly it was not an ideal service. So it comes back to this whole need to have rigorous um, methods and really understand, you know, how things are working when they're not working. Um, and also just, just a recent um, little study that we did and this and again highlights another issue with eDNA. So eDNA can have so many issues. There's so many issues about detectability and that's gonna be sometimes organism dependent. So you need to sort of understand those things. Sampling dependent, we need to understand about sampling. And then the next thing is about identifying what we what we are getting. Now, this was a, a project we did with um, uh, New South Wales Environment and it was in the Snowy River um, catchment and Murrumbidgee. And we were looking at, um, they wanted to know, um, well, particularly we're interested in targeting a couple of species, the presence of a couple of species, but also just overall kind of diversity as well. And in this, um, so you can see we got a whole bunch of things. We got what, which were expected. We got things like short-finned eels, long-finned eels. We got goldfish, gambusia, galaxids, rainbow trout, brown trout. 
one of the things that they were really interested in was Macquarie Perch. And we did find, and that's just here and these two sites, um, which is this Blythe property and, um, and this site here, which is the um, Coonaroo. And Fiona, which was the one they weren't expecting Macquarie Perch or didn't, you can't remember. <laughs> um, so one of these sites, let's just say, I think it was this one actually, um, this Coonaroo site, they were not expecting Macquarie Perch um, and were then a little critical of the data because they thought, well, that that can't be right because, you know, we haven't seen them there or whatever. And then there was, they consulted with our resident amazing expert, Mark Lindemans, and he went, oh, yeah, occasionally you will see them because it's up above a weir. You will occasionally see them there, um, but they've not, you know, not to the level of being established. But that just showed that, you know, we could, we could detect something there that they were not necessarily expecting. So that was all really good. Out of this, though, we got, um, as you can see, in, in um, this um, location, we got a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, oh no, not that one. What am I looking at? Yes, the green. A lot of galaxids. So there were a lot of galaxids going on here. And of course, we're not fish people. We just do the analysis, run them through the bioinformatic pipeline. We rely on what reference databases there, that there are. And um, this highlights this whole lack of reference database. So effectively, we got um, 29 ASVs, which is um, these sequence variants, were identified as potentially five galaxid species. Um, this was noting that this is 112 um, base pair sequence from the 12S gene. Effectively, not a lot of resolution going on. So the targeted region is almost identical across 15 species that we know of. And, um, and that group two and group four in this case could be two different species, but with a lack of reference database, um, we ended up identifying them to a species that was probably not the right species for that location. So we had to do a bit of explaining back to um, the, the Environment New South Wales team that, look, we're confident there are galaxids there, but we cannot um, reliably tell you the species because of a lack of reference database. So that is something that has to absolutely be improved. And currently there is a um, national um, biodiversity um, database being developed for specifically for eDNA purposes, and that has been driven out of CSIRO, um, and with the idea that all of uh, Australia's biodiversity is going to fall in under that that database. But that database is essential. So you can see that you know as much as we can say galaxid, that that's as good as we get on the galaxid front. Um, also, Elise um, in this paper, which when she was doing this work in uh, water holes in Central Australia. She published this really nice piece of work um, that really shows where all our little problems can lie with um, eDNA and particularly this technology of eDNA metabarcoding when we're doing multi-species detections. Um, there's so much that can go go poor, oh, so much that can go badly here. We can have everything from oh, contamination at the study site, field contamination at the sampling collection side of things. We can get cross contaminations happening at all all points along here. We get, you know, can get laboratory contamination happening when we're dealing with our PCR and our amplicons. Anything to do with trace DNA is a nightmare. Um, so that's the contamination side of it. Then we can get onto the misidentification side of it, where we get everything from errors in terms of our amplification. You get things um, called, you know, the sort of chimeric sequences that can still sneak through your workflow and cause grief. Um, sequencing errors can occur pending, you know, again, the platform that you're using. And then when we get to the informatics, we've got all sorts of things about poor taxonomic matches and complete reference databases, errors in those reference databases, because that if you go to GenBank, you will find all sorts of uh, horrible things in there that are incorrect because there's no curation going on for those databases. And those databases don't necessarily link back to a actual specimen. So there's improvements that need to be done there. So this is where it all can go badly. And that's why um, in terms of coming back to delivering good biodiversity monitoring, we need to be able to um, create approaches that are going to unify us across, um, you know, nationally so that each, um, each lab provider group that you go to, you know that you're going to get consistent data. So um, what we have been doing is um, we've been trying to corral most of the eDNA um, community in Australia to do this um, because there are, 
in our time of, you know, last 10 years, there's been a lot of labs, a lot of groups popping up all over because of the popularity of this technology and, you know, all of them wading in on the eDNA space, which is totally fine. There's tons of things to be done in this space, but it's important to ensure that given those inconsistencies that can happen, that there is at least some unified approach to be able to deliver this at a national level. So what we have done, um, so our team here, so the EcoDNA Lab, we are now, um, we host the National eDNA Reference Centre. This reference centre is a collaboration, um, a partnership with the um, Australian federal government. So we're a partner with the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Initially, we were with the Super Department of Ag, Water and the Environment. So we're still working on the Department of um, Environment, Energy, Environment, Climate Change and yeah, energy, energy and water. <laughs> DQ. So we are working on the, the DQ side of things and we're still waiting on um, where they are sitting in terms of biodiversity monitoring, but we're still plowing on anyway. Um, so our facility here is the NATA accredited facility. So what NATA accreditation does is that it absolutely gives that quality assurance to the processes and procedures that are happening within your in, in a, a given facility. And um, next Tuesday, we are very excited to launch our new Trace DNA facility uh, upon building on the legacy of Steve and the Trace DNA facility that we've been uh, working in a broom cupboard literally in um, building two for a number of years. And now because of this expansion, we need this new facility. So the new facility opens next Tuesday over in building seven. So we're super excited by that. And the NADA accreditation team are going to be heading towards us in a few weeks. So it's a little stressful for the team, but I know you guys have got it nailed. Um, so what the National eDNA Reference Centre does is that we are there to provide that QA, QC. We have our collaborating centres, which are all of these main um, groups, labs around Australia and also New Zealand. We've got Wilder Lab and Sequench in New Zealand that have joined up. And we've got additional labs that are starting to come to the party because we, are, or we have an open door party um, policy as long as you wear the same clothes. Um, <laughs> and so... What this does is it enables us to do things like um, administer a proficiency testing scheme. So basically what we do is we send out blind, you know, samples. We then get those participating laboratories. They then send back their data. They can then see how well they're performing or not performing against expectation. There's always going to be variability, but we need to have that sort of standardization and consistency in order for eDNA to be adopted um, as the tool that we believe that um, it can be. So um, out of that, um, the collaborative um, have put together a couple of guidelines. Um, recently, this happened last year, a lot of stakeholder workshops and engagement happened. And um, this developed these two guidelines. We now have a, an environmental DNA test validation guideline on how you validate your assays and the, the standard approach for doing that. We've also developed um, protocols, um, development guide for biomonitoring. So what we would um, you know, say is best practice for biomonitoring. So this was a great um, piece of work, um, multi-collaborative, very inclusive and really proud of it. And Paula, you corralled a number of people. So thank you so much for that, herding cats. <laughs> so um, where to now? Um, we are um, pushing strongly, I think, in terms of this biodiversity monitoring. Um, eDNA alone is not the, the solution. There are multiple other data layers that um, can equally contribute um, to building up a biodiversity monitoring program for Australia. Um, things like remote sensing, um, acoustics, camera trapping in conjunction with eDNA, I think are the strongest um, combination of technologies that can really offer the solution in a way that's scalable and deployable and give us the sort of indicators on biodiversity that we need. Um, so what we're doing, I am collaborating with the University of Sydney and the University of Sydney have a um, bunch of farms um, at their disposal and they have a farm, a very large farm in um, Narrabri. 
and this farm is about to undergo a massive um, tree planting restoration project early next year. It's an opportunity for us. And also the other thing about that, that, that farm is it's nearby a national park. So there's also, we've got that, um, the natural um, environment happening there as well. So what we're going to do um, is we're going to, at scale, at a very large scale, um, de deploy our multifaceted monitoring um, technologies and we are going to um, establish a baseline from where we can then move for further monitoring. So the vision of, of our biodiversity challenge is to optimise standard, standardised sampling approach for Australia's biodiversity. We aim to achieve it by using the latest remote sensing tools um, to measure at scale. The scope is a combination of airborne eDNA, drone surveys, camera traps, acoustic monitoring, and this will be characterizing um, biodiversity on and around um, Lalara before and after planting of 200 hectares of native, native trees. And the objective to quantif quali quantify regions biodiversity in effective, reproducible and cost-effective manner and use that data to develop a biodiversity metric and, or, and metrics that can provide confidence to business and government under this TNFD framework and the global biodiversity framework. And um, yeah, and with the goal that we can then start to pull that out into potential commercial activity. So that's kind of where we're sitting at the moment, working and, and again, working with partners where we know that um, they've got the capacity to help us deliver. So just a thank you, um, here's the happy team um, and I, just a plug for the Southern eDNA Society. Um, we have just um, developed a, a well, um, a bunch of us that have come together that were part of those developing those standards and um, guidelines. We've now formed a new society, the Southern eDNA Society. I'm one of the um, a founding board member, which is like another punishing thing for my life. Um, and we had our first conference this year, which was incredible. We had um, almost 300 people come. We had a large number of talks and the diversity of eDNA uh, work that's going on in Australia is actually incredible. And it was an amazing event, so full of excitement. Um, so many young people, like, um, so hopefully this will be one of my last talks because I'm too old to, you know, I need all the young people giving the talks. Um, and it was a really vibrant, fun event. And so I really am excited about the future of where we head with this technology, but um, it also needs the community to come together and to work really closely together to ensure that we are gonna deliver something that is going to launch us forward. So thank you, any questions? So I will repeat, I will reiterate a question. So in terms of, yeah, well, we have SADI, so the South Australian um, that, uh, government, so that's a, a government lab. Um, a lot of the um, government, th these are about sort of bringing together the labs and the providers in the eDNA space. So there's a lot of users in um, some of these, um, in, in some of those organisations, but not necessarily the facilities. So we're trying to sort of bring together those that have the facilities. So we have the Northern Territory government are actually coming on board and they're sending a bunch of people down for some training. So that's one of the things that, uh, that as the activity of the National eDNA Reference Centre is to provide training for, um, for a organizations that are wanting to develop this capacity and capability so yeah so we are trying to sort of corral as many of the um you know different organizations whether they be within universities or commercial providers or um within the state government agencies so doing our best as they pop up richard richard you had a question Mm. Yeah. Quantitative, yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so from a quantitative perspective, it is difficult because um, there are so many reasons as to why um, meta barcoding outputs will not give you um, necessarily relate what you're getting in terms of read number back to the actual biomass um, of organisms. And that's often what has been asked for. And there's so many reasons for that. Um, some species are going to produce more um, you know, eDNA into the environment than others. So it's not going to give you that sort of relativity. Um, there are things you can do. You can kind of put things of known quantities into your, as positive controls into the um, original, um, you know, samples that you're doing. So you can run them alongside and you can use that to calibrate. So there are ways of potentially calibrating. But I think that um, quantitative PCR, I think is very useful. So for single species detections, we are definitely um, able to have some sort of relativity in the basis of what we're getting in our qPCR result to abundance. Um, but that is something that's a bit elusive at the moment. So really presence absence is the best we can do right now. Um, and it can give you things about, um, you know, species richness, but it can't tell you abundance per se, unless you, um, you know, you can try and build some controls in to try and calibrate but it's tricky. But the technology is moving forward and I feel that we will get to a space where we can do this and that will come when we are able to, you know, extract from single cells out of the environment. So I've sort of seen that happening and we can then start to do things from a, from a population genetic um, perspective as well. Richard. So, so like for the, um, the farm biodiversity, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, there is, yeah, there is, there is already baseline data from other work that they've done there. So they've done a lot of like camera trapping and there's been other um, studies that have been done out there that we can then kind of draw upon. Um, we are going to be using an, an alongside of that um, camera data and acoustics. So it's really dependent on the, yeah, so we're still working out which type of biodiversity we're going to um, to target because obviously you could go from everything from microorganisms right up the scale and there is going to be limitations on the reference database. So we sort of probably want to stick to large things that are visible that have got um either the pre-existing data or can be collected alongside. So it's really about also when it comes down to that sort of the real truth of what's there, what doesn't matter so much. I actually feel that, and then we can get ourselves tied in knots over this, that um, it's really about trying to measure some sort of change. And so no matter, so whatever it is that we use now, as long as it's the consistent thing that we use in another, um, in our you know, next iteration. So a year later, when we want to go back and do another monitoring exercise, we've got that baseline from the data that we have collected. And as long as the methods and approach stay the same, then at least we've got something to come back to collect, to um, compare with. I mean, I'm getting, you know, queries at the moment from organisations like a um, company that manages a whole lot of farms in Australia. And at the moment, they, they don't really don't care what biodiversity we're measuring. They don't care. They just care that they can show that they're doing something positive for the environment. So in their case, they were kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, well, frogs. Can you do frogs? Because like there's frogs here. And then maybe, you know, whatever it is that we're doing from a sustainable farming practice, at least we can, you know, compare what's happening with our frogs. So there's, yeah, it, it, you can kind of tie yourself in knots of not getting the perfect data. And I think we, we kind of need to move forward. And this is probably better than the data that's existing at the moment that is imperfect and yet is being used by commercial providers to provide information right now. And that scares me. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I would argue, I'm about the need for a better database. So, you know, you see things like this, 
Oh, it's the marker. Yeah, it's short. <laughs> short marker. <laughs> yes. 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 Exactly. And that, you know, designing the assays to, to do that. Um, so, yes, we could probably come up with a beautiful Galaxid um, one, but then it's just Galaxid. So if, if all you want to measure is Galaxids, then that's fine. But if you wanted to get, you know, all diversity of um, fish, then you need to probably go for something else that's going to, you know, cross across all of those things. So it really is hard to, you know, um, in the case of the Galaxids, it's definitely there is that trade-off of fragment length and the diversity in those fragments as well. So you can have a short fragment if it's variable. It doesn't matter. And there is not necessarily an optimal length. I wouldn't say so. I would say that what it is is, is about optimal um, uh, variability and and resolution. So you say you got 300 bases. Um. It yeah, I mean it depends on again on the depends on the marker because some of them are more robust and particularly obviously mitochondrial DNA is more robust. Um, but then you start to run into issues about sequence depth if you're trying to do longer fragments. So yeah, there is a trade-off. Peter's working on that, aren't you? Yeah, she's working it all out for frogs. <laughs> Peter. Kind of a, a part of the question, if you like, um, one is that you mentioned the word CSRO doing um, uh, kind of database supports, but is that designed to try and link Australia's taxonomic base? Claire, I read the other day, Google wouldn't take it to something. Yes. But, uh, yeah. I know it's it's a problem. Is that what is that what's what's happening under that? And second question, um, partly related to what Bridget was saying, I think a slightly different tack is that the, the DNFD that, that you referred to, mm. I think a lot of what they're going to need is not necessarily about species change, but about ecosystem service change. Yes. Um, so can you Yes, yes. So um yeah agree about the TNFD that um, ecosystem services, which again, eDNA can be, you know, part of providing that information because we're targeting then taxa or like particularly when it gets to microorganisms and things like that, that we know that are functionally important. So we can kind of make, um, you know, nuances and extrapolations from that. But um, the nature repair market bill was very much focused on species-based changes mm -hmm. so um, we would be responding to probably what Australia was is wanting to implement um, and then that was supposed to be fulfilling those you know requirements for the TNFD so there's still a bit of murkiness in that space um, but yeah I mean the technology is kind of transferable across to that definitely it's about targeting what tax are um, yes the tax the taxonomic impediment the impediment is still there um, and the tax I would look, I'd love my taxonomist dearly. And um, I look, collections are getting shifted into the, the new century now. And the need to rapidly or to utilize the tools of AI and image analysis and, you know, machine learning alongside of genomics is really now starting to advance forward where we go to with these databases and reference databases. So definitely the, um, the NDBL, so the National Data Biodiversity Data Library, MBDL, anyway, that library is um, cross-referenced to a specimen. So there's a specimen from which it's been derived from and um, the collections are kind of paramount in that because they're kind of providing that that reference point to a specimen so that you can you know, go and find the, the specimen in a collection. Um, yeah, it, look, it, it, there's a lot going on in, in the space now with um, trying to trying to overcome that impediment with technology, and so I think you know we will 
get there. The arguments still obviously exist about what is a species and your species concept. Um, sometimes we're just going to have to deal with the fact that we won't resolve anything more than, all right, we can get a genus. And that's probably good enough, you know? So yeah, good accept. Accept the limitations. Robin, you had something. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Because there's, the, yeah, that absolutely impacts um, on your detectability, but also, you know, um, how informative the information that you find is actually informative to that particular area. There's still so much to be done in that, definitely. And certainly the whole, because everyone's gotten excited about airborne eDNA, but airborne eDNA is a minefield um, because of all of those things um, that we still need to be um, ironing out before we can kind of deploy airborne eDNA as a tool. Um, so but we're excited about airborne eDNA because I've seen some really amazing data from it. It's incredible, but we still need to understand a lot more about those, you know, like you say, those environmental attributes that are, that are giving you the, the information. <laughs> There's plenty of research to be done. <laughs> yeah, we're done. We're done, Burnt. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh, okay, cool. Excellent. All good? Yeah. Was it? Uh -huh, there was there. He's like my, he's like my bitch. He's covering him <laughs> up once again. He's, he's my bitch. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you one thing, uh, Guy. So you mentioned Jonas's study. Yeah. The actual biggest finding from that study is the second population.